Good evening. Welcome to Book Passage. Um, thank you all for coming out this evening. We really appreciate when you come out to these wonderful author events that we are so lucky to and fortunate to host here at Book Passage. My name is Melissa Sestaro, and I have the honor and pleasure of introducing the exceptional international best-selling author, David Vann. <laughs> Legend of a Suicide, and the novels Caribou Island, Dirt, Goat, Mountain, and Last Day on Earth. <coughs> David's work has been read in 20 languages. He's won many prestigious prizes for his work. He has been a Guggenheim and a Stegner Fellow. He has degrees from both Stanford and Cornell, and he currently teaches at the University of Warwick in England. <coughs> Correct? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> <Check it out. laughs> this evening, David is here with his beautiful and haunting fifth novel, Aquarium. Caitlin Thompson is a 12 year old girl who understands her world through the lens of aquatic life. And each day after school, she walks to the aquarium where she carefully observes the underwater world and visits the old man who she has befriended. There is so much poetic force in David's writing. It's the kind of story that telling that makes us pause and reflect, but it also really plunges us deep into that ocean where it is dark and mysterious and quiet. It is with great pleasure that we welcome David Van to the passage this evening. Thank you. Um, so thanks first to Book Passage uh, for having me here for readings for many books. They've been supportive right from the beginning, first book, when I was basically calling on the phone myself and begging, please, <laughs> so thank you for the support all the way along. Um, I've, I've had book tours now in 30 countries, and so I've really been able to see uh, what literary culture is like and what book selling is like across all these countries. And the, the most intact literary culture is France, uh, by far. And it's because they have an independent bookseller in every neighborhood throughout the whole country. And so there are communities of readers who come together in that bookstore, they meet each other, get married. And, but they come to, <laughs> for advice for like 10 or 20 years to a bookseller, you know, what, what should I read next? And it's uh, because of that, because there's a community of readers in every neighborhood, a book when it comes out there has 50 reviews in newspapers and magazines. It's incredible. They have primetime TV shows about books. I was on at 8 p.m. on Thursday night on TV with a guy who had a book about math. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine that happening here. There are four of us talking about our books, and the audience was willing on Thursday evening to hear four people talk about their books, including men. Um, and then they have uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of uh, festivals and prizes. Uh, it's just, it's incredible. And so um, it's really, I'm very happy that you're supporting your local independent bookseller because I've been able to see what happened to England where they lost their price control a dozen years ago and losing the price control where you can't discount a book more than 5%, that's what tends to drive independent booksellers out of business. They lost that government control and so they're kind of halfway between France and us. They've lost a lot of independent booksellers, they have some who are still holding strong, but essentially they have two customers. They have the biggest brick and mortar chain and Amazon and that's really all that my publisher says that's all he has <coughs> as clients actually. That, he has those two customers. Uh, and uh, it's really, uh, it's quite depressing and limiting because what the independent booksellers do is give a wider range of books a life and they uh, let a book live for a longer time, like for a year. So um, anyway, it's great. I think in the US, it was depressing from 2005 to 2008 when I had my first two book tours. I had visited 30 independent booksellers the first time and half of them were out of business by the second time, oh. three years later. But then since then, there's been some stabilizing and even growth and new stores opening. So it seems like we've turned the corner and it's getting better, but thanks for coming and supporting. 
Um, this uh, uh, book is a big uh, departure for me. It's the first one that's not the first fiction that doesn't have my family in the background. Like, yeah. <laughs> my family is really relieved. Like my mother and sister are very brave, and they read all of my books. But uh, my uncle in Idaho, my aunt, they haven't read a book of mine for a long time. <laughs> so they were really pleased about this. My aunt's already like half the way through by the time I left there. Uh, she's so happy not to read about herself. So, um, <laughs> so it's a big change. It's also the first one that's not a tragedy. Uh, it's actually about forgiveness and a family coming back together. It's the kinder, gentler David Van. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I like writing tragedy. I love a tragedy. And I like the kind of weird transformations that take place. I mean, it was fun writing dirt that's a blend, the characters, a blend of some of Galen, a bunch of me, like some of my family history. And it was fun. Like, it was kind of a guilty pleasure, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> and, uh, and it was fun to write Goat Mountain, which is the deer hunting ranch we went on. And it, and it explored uh, the possibilities of kind of what was there. Um, my dad used to let me aim at poachers, uh, the hunters who were illegally on the land. Whenever we'd arrive, he'd let me aim at the poacher through his 300 Magnum with a shell in the chamber and the safety off. So if I had just tapped the trigger, the guy would be dead. And there was some kind of s very strange <laughs> moment with that. And I did it when I was 10 and 11 and 12. And, and uh, so in that book, um, the boy just pulls the trigger in the, in the first chapter. So the fictions have been ways to explore possibilities of what might have been. In the first one, Legend of Suicide, um, I go spend, it's a boy and a father homesteading for a year in Alaska, spending that year together. My dad had asked me to do that, and I said no. So it was a kind of second chance to do that. So to me, it's been actually uh, very kind of redemptive and healing to write tragedy. It's kind of helped make me whole in some ways. Um, but it was nice to turn a corner and finish with the family stories with Goat Mountain and to write something more generous and, uh, and ultimately not a tragedy and something where the men are likable. Uh, this is the first time I've ever written likable men. Both of the men here are good. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, generous. So, uh, strange. <laughs> so, um, I'll read. You know, I, when I gave a reading in LA recently, I just had people shout out page numbers, and I read from there. And that was a lot more fun for me. The, the problem with that is that there's one spoiler, like, you know, who someone is. Uh, so, you get one spoiler. Uh, but I don't think it's that big deal. It's kind of fun just to read random parts instead of, you know, set things from early on. So,. I don't know. Does anyone really not want the spoiler? In which case, I'll I'll stick with the early. Spoiler is when you give away what happens in the book. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> if I read from later pages, then you'll know something about one of the characters, which you don't know on the first pages. I don't think it wrecks the book to know. Well, what number? What page number does that happen? And we'll go. Before yeah, that, read after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm only on page 45. <laughs> so. Uh, let's see. I can figure that out pretty quickly. <laughs> Do we just call out our favorite number? <laughs> <laughs> Since we don't have the book right here. Yeah, we have the book right here. Well, yeah, but I have to figure it out. Oh, crap. It turns out it's not all that bad. So you'd have to start in the middle of a scene, maybe? Yeah, yeah, just kind of be wherever. That's OK. We don't have to do it that way. So it's right around page 80. That uh, Yeah, it's like 75. Page 35. Okay, 35. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> We're at risk of a really long pause. <laughs> uh, 35 is short. Okay. Short page. <laughs> 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 need a longer page. 35 ends the chapter. So how about I start with chaos. Settle down, Gina. 36. I'll start with 36 then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm not leaving a, you. Okay, uh, a book that's earmarked. I have a so favorite page earmarked. So I'm not walking out on my son's room. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's when you know you've hit bottom. <laughs> so, um, okay, Steve spent the night. I could hear their breathing and small cries from my mother as if she were hurt, but I knew to stay in my room and keep quiet. My mother had explained many times that some parts of her life were hers. I had my three pillows, my pillow palace, a kind of nest or cave, and I sank away there. In the morning, Steve made cinnamon toast, which was something new, butter and then sugar and cinnamon. He put one piece face up on my plate and then cut another piece on its diagonals to make four triangles, and with these he made a pyramid. 
Egyptian toast, he said, with cinnamon from the Nile. What fish are in the Nile? The pharaoh fish, Steve said, and raised his eyebrows. He leaned in close and whispered so my mother wouldn't hear. They have scales of red marble, very heavy, and fins of gold. There are no fish like that. Have you been to the Nile? No. Well, I used to live there, at the bottom of the river. Don't tell your mother. The pharaoh fish gathered all along the bottom as if they were a garden of gold. They had big lips that never opened their mouths. They were very quiet, but they were keeping all the gold for the next pharaoh. How come I haven't heard about the pharaoh fish? Well, you have now, and you have to keep it a secret because of the gold. 5,000 years ago, someone told, and the biggest fish had to leave the river and burrow through sand and try to hide. The great pyramids with their fins sticking up out of the sand. They were the biggest pharaoh fish. I laughed and punched his arm the way my mother did. No fish are that big, I said. The largest fish is the whale shark. Now, he said, but not back then. I was distracted all morning at school thinking about the pharaoh fish. I knew Steve was making them up, but I loved the idea of their golden fins and red marble scales, and I could see them all waiting at the bottom of the river, their bellies on sand. Shalini, I said, we have to make a pharaoh fish. We had just begun our period, and Shalini already had strips of newspaper ready for Lakshmi Rudolph's legs. What is a pharaoh fish? They have red scales and golden fins. I've seen golden fish, but I think they're Buddhist. Where have you seen them? On tiles, on walls in India, I think. And you can buy plastic ones, or as balloons. Do people pray to them? I guess so. That's my religion, then. I'm Buddhist. <laughs> Shalini laughed. You can't just be a new religion. There were two ways to make shapes for paper mache, using wire or balloons. And we had some long, skinny balloons, so I blew up one of these and began wrapping it in Shalini strips. I imagined great temples with fish altars, and I would become a priestess. I would wear a red makeup with golden lips and eyebrows. What's this, Caitlin? Mr. Gustafson asked. He looked out of breath from running around the room, his nostrils working hard. A golden fish that will have red scales and golden fins. Let's keep focused on task. We want Rudolph to have legs, right, so he can lead the sleigh? But the golden fish is for my religion. I'm Buddhist. You're Buddhist? <laughs> yes. Caitlin. I am. What will your mother have to say about that? She'll say I'm Buddhist. I'm a vegetarian. I pray to the golden fish, and I may become a priestess. <laughs> you eat the school lunch. I know you're not Buddhist. And don't we already have enough religions? We need a few people to still be Christian. I pray to the golden fish. This is my God. OK, fine. Pray to the fish. I'm going to make a paper mache of my butt and pray to that. This <laughs> <laughs> a really effective teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Gustafson left then to try to save the sleigh. He had four kids working, but it looked like a fence with scraps blowing against it. <laughs> You're in trouble, Sheldon whispered in my ear, leaning close. She was deliriously happy about it. All little hair stood up on my neck and I had goosebumps. Sheldon could make me shiver, as if my entire body were a bell that had just been struck. Uh, I think rather than continue on, we should shout out a new page. I have one. Okay. The last two lines of 56 and then 57. Okay. Oh, that's specific. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Cool. Um, I watched only, this is Caitlin with her mother. I watched only a few parts of the movie. Mostly I watched the shifting light on the balconies above us, great rock formations on the seawall extending upward to a surface I couldn't see. We were set back in the lowest cave the safest place in the largest school, all hung vertical like razorfish, but not inverted. The roof above us, the floor to another cave, all eyes peering outward into endless expanse, open ocean, heavy curtains on the walls in folds, like dark rippling of light in the depths, all seeming to move closer. The faces around me all registering the same emotions at once, and maintaining perfect spacing, flash of cheeks as they turn their heads and then gone in darkness again, crunching sounds as they fed on the reef, always feeding even as they watched. All was the same as when I watched TV with my mother at home, except now we were in a large school. Two of us or two hundred of us, there was no difference. All silent still, watching, looking outward into the light, waiting. And the sea itself unchanged, sound magnified, booming, and only sound marked time. Even as a kid, I felt this sense that there was no why to any fish or person. The school could be 199 instead of 200, and this would have no effect on the ocean, no effect on sound or time or light. I was always vanishing. In that theater, I appeared and disappeared and reappeared, all without effect, and the rock above remained constant in the formless air. I tried to do what my mother did, tasting the salt and fat and oil that I had pizza before, and now watching patterns of light before sleep, but I could never immerse. I was never able to find my way into any tank at all. We drove home in darkness, this car the smallest cave, glow of instrument lights on my mother's face, moving at impossible speed, as if our wheels had no contact with ground. My mother lost in the movie still. She had grabbed my hand in the tense or sad moments. I don't think she was even aware she did it. Immersion came naturally to her. 
When we arrived home, she was tired and quiet, and we simply went to bed. She didn't make me go to my own room, but her bed might as well have stretched hundreds of feet across. The freedom of pizza and the movie was over. Now there was only her exhaustion, and another day of hard work waiting after a sleep too short. Too soon we were back in the car, driving again in darkness, north in a stream of lights, some massive current sweeping all of us toward the greater light. Seattle something resting on the ocean floor, enormous starfish with bright ridges and fingers of black between. Bioluminescent globe pulling everything near, individual lights of aircraft in the depths above like deep sea anglers. Their bodies invisible, shapes drifting through darkness and cold and no sound, nothing known. <clears throat> uh, I seem like I could just stop there. I mean, it does. It goes on and on. You know, <laughs> just you turn one page after another, and there's another page. Uh, so, yeah, I think that seems like enough for that section. Um, if you pick a later page and we're okay with the spoiler, then you can get more fireworks, more dramatic, <coughs> you know, dramatic moments. Um, but uh, but yeah, we could we could avoid the spoilers. I noticed you said yeah. there's there's no tragedy in the book, but I noticed two or three times they edge towards tragedy, mm -hmm. and it seems like it's going to be really tragic, and then it pulls back, and it's like, oh, phew. Yeah. <laughs> well, later in the book, I mean, there is, there is a, tragedy. yeah, there is kind of some weird <laughs> drama. There's some knockdown <laughs> dragons. Some pretty And then uh, they pull it together, you know. Yeah, 102. 102. All right. Bravery. <laughs> Anyone doesn't want a spoiler, just cover your ears for a second or run around the corner. I'm curious what 102 is going to be. <clears throat> okay. That's right before the beginning of a chapter. So can I go to the previous page to start the chapter? Oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay. We'll just try. I lay awake that night thinking of my mother. <clears throat> this other life, a shadow of my own. Terrible weight of a debt unpayable. What do we owe for what has come before us, the previous generations? I had no words for this at 12, only the weight. This is a retrospective narrator. She's 32 looking back to when she was 12. Um, I had no words for this at 12, only the weight. And I think of it still. That sense of my own life held in arrest until my mother and her mother can be compensated. I don't know if it's just, only that it is. The problem is that we can never enter the shadow world in order to make payment. We can't get there or even believe it. My grandmother lying in her bed dying. And what of her life before her dying? Who was she then? I'd have to know that time, too, in order to know what has to be restored. I lay awake and tried to see her, but I could see only my mother's face. I couldn't make my grandmother anything except the same. And so my own mother seemed already to have died and been there as nurse at her own dying and now lived again. And was I any different or only the same woman's future? The dead reaching for us, needing us, but this isn't true. There's only us reaching for them, trying to find ourselves. In the morning, we rose in darkness, my mother looking destroyed. She poured cereal and some went on the counter and she seemed not to notice. We ate at the table with only the small light from over the sink. Darkness and shadow, teeth chewing and nothing else moving, the way I imagined all the tanks after the aquarium closed. I'd seen the light go out in one of the small tanks for freshwater fish, the green plants gone black, and the fish the same, water clear as air unseen, and only a brief moment of reflection, scales caught in light, then turned and vanished again, a world erased. We drove toward the great lights, pulled north, all shapes lit only along their edges, outlined in silver, rail cars and overhead wires and bridges not yet fully made, returning to a normal day, but with no sense anymore of what that was. Would I see the old man at the aquarium after school? We slid up to Gatzer, the curb empty, that's her school. No one else in sight, no movement. I'll pick you up right here, my mother said. I don't know what time, maybe five, maybe later. I have to make up for yesterday. I want to go to the aquarium. No, you'll meet me right here. She was gone then, and I was left only under, and I was left alone under a sky still black and without stars, the air cold and wet, even without rain. I wondered if I could walk to the aquarium after school, see the old man, and get back in time for my mother not to know. I knocked on the glass doors, and a janitor let me in, an old man who didn't speak English, a kind of ghost, blue coveralls, and a face hidden away. And I think I don't really have to continue with that, but that's interesting. That's a piece you can read from later. And it doesn't give away any spoiler. Mm -hmm. You just know something. <laughs> <laughs> That's like perfect. I, I mean, I should note that. Page 101. Mm -hmm. Safe. <laughs> so, um, another one? About something early, like three. Three? Uh, okay. Three. 
Now that no, we know all this other stuff. Yeah. Random stuff. Okay, yeah. the top of three. I looked at him then, the old man, mottled flesh like the fish, uh, comparing him to the three-spot frog, frog fish, which has a lovely photo on page one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Love this picture. Yeah, the production quality. I want to buy six copies just so I can touch them. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at him then, the old man, mottled flesh like the fish, hair hanging over and apart the way this fish's upper fin curled over the eggs. Mouth in a grimace, lips downward, small eyes buried in puffy lined flesh, camouflaged, looking away. He was afraid. Why are you here? I asked. I just want to see. I don't have much time. Well, you can watch the fish with me. Thank you. The frogfish wasn't floating above the rocks. He was clinging to them. He looked like he would flee at any moment, but he hadn't moved except to readjust his toes. I bet it's warm in there, the man said. Tropical water, Indonesia. A whole life spent surrounded by warm water. Like never getting out of the bath. Exactly. Another strange fish floated by higher above us, like leopard print lace with a splotch stretched. See-through fins and no shape of a fish, only a splotch of pattern. Mm -hmm. Dun -dun -dun. <laughs> <laughs> I never had a picture book before. Was like, yeah. My first experience with them. So a uh, striated frogfish, the man said, a relative. Its Latin name mentions the antenna. Where's his mouth or his eye or anything? I don't know. How can they even call that a fish? It's a good question. How old are you? The man grinned. It sounds like you're questioning how I can even be called a human. Sorry. It's okay, I have to admit, I wonder about this myself. If I can hardly walk, and I'm alone, and I'm no longer recognizable, my face, nothing like it was before, all the parts of it hiding away, so that I'm a surprise, even to myself. And can you call that what you called it before? Isn't it something new? And if no one else sees it, is it anything? I'm sorry. No, it's an interesting question, one we should think about together. It'd be my pleasure. We can think about whether he's a fish and I'm a human. <laughs> well, I have to go. It's almost 4.30, so my mother might drive up. What time will you be here tomorrow? School's out at 2.40, so about quarter after three. Where do you go to school? Gets it. Isn't that a long way to walk? Yeah, okay, bye. I walked away in a hurry through those dark corridors ruined in light. The aquarium itself felt like it was underwater, a submarine at tremendous depth. And then I'd emerge into the lobby, and suddenly it was another world. The bright clouds of Seattle sunset, a few orange patches in gray, streets wet. Snow turned to black and brown slush, waiting to become ice. My mother not yet at the curb. Oh, sorry, I never actually said, turn the phones off. Yeah. So, Oh, and I didn't turn mine off. Yeah. Well, no one calls me, so it's okay. <laughs> I haven't received a single call in my entire visit here. Um, so anyway, where am I? Um, so now I turned to black and brown slush, waiting to become ice. My mother not yet at the curb. I put my coat on and zipped up. I loved the feel of being doubled in size. I pulled the hood over my head, fake fur. I was almost invisible. My mother rarely showed up at 4.30. I, almost, I always started waiting then, but I had a lot of time to look at the railroad tracks across the street and the freeway overpasses beyond. Great slabs of dark concrete in the sky, the world banded. You could go north or south from here, and we always went south. The street was called Alaskan Way, but we never went that way. Trucks and endless cars, concrete and sand and cold, nothing like the world of fish. They had never felt wind, they had never been cold or seen snow, but they did have to wait. All they did was wait. And what did they see in the glass? Did they see us, or only reflections of themselves? A house of mirrors. I was going to be an ichthyologist when I grew up. I was going to live in Australia, or Indonesia, or Belize, or on the Red Sea, and spent most of my days submerged in that same warm water, a fish tank stretching thousands of miles. The problem with the aquarium was that we couldn't join them. So, yeah, that ends chapter. I mean, I can read the <coughs> beginning of the next one if you want to learn, but, but yeah, we could, uh, how are we doing for time? Should I go to questions now, or we do one more shout out? One more? Okay, one more, one more page number. Twenty-six. Twenty-six. <laughs> That's all the Okay. <clears throat> so um, I'll start uh, just like a paragraph on, before on the page before. So it makes some sense. Okay. The only thing that kept me moving along that street each afternoon, she's walking from the school to the aquarium, which is what she does every day, was the blue at the end, the sea visible because we were on a hill. That blue promised the aquarium, a gauntlet leading to a sanctuary. I could have stayed in an after-school program, but it was my choice to visit the fish. They were emissaries sent from a larger world. They were the same as possibility, a kind of promise. When I crossed over the freeway, downtown began, the hill slanting downward, Large buildings shaped like wedges burrowed into the hill, hiding in their own caves. 
hunched for safety, as if something enormous swam in the skies above. One brave skyscraper at the end with a pointy top, trying not to look soft. The entire city, a colony by <laughs> coral, made of an endless network of small chambers. I imagined each room a polyp, a creature without a spine, tentacled mouth looking up toward the sky, finding a place to sit and excreting its exoskeleton, a thin layer of concrete, to attach itself here forever. At each full moon, waving its tentacles upward and releasing gametes, fairy creatures made of light, each of them a new room floating through the air, looking for a place to build itself. And so the city would grow without end, but why here? This was no Bali or Belize. Cold, raining all the time, windy, overcast, and dark. Seattle never made sense to me. We had orchids and beautiful islands I had never seen, called the San Juans, but why the city? I walked along the ferry terminal, the large green and white ferries that went to these islands, and I wished my mother was free and had money and we could ride north on the water. We would never stop, we would just keep voyaging all over the world, across to Japan and down to the Philippines, from island to island, learning to dive, visiting every reef. I passed fireboats and private yachts, the same private yachts that were always at the dock, never used, always waiting, owned by people with money who never left either, caught somewhere in the city. The waterfront park and in the aquarium, I had a yearly pass, but they all recognized me here, and I never had to show it. I just walked in as if it were my home. I found them at the darkest tank in a corner alone, peering through what could have been a window to the stars, endless black and cold and only a few points of light, hung in this void like a small constellation, the ghost pipefish, impossible. Like a leaf giving birth to stars, I said, whispering, as if any sound might make the fish vanish. Yes, the old man whispered back, exactly that. I couldn't have said it better myself. Sometimes I can't believe you're only 12. You should become an ichthyologist. This is who you are. Body of small green leaves, veined, very thin. Its fins painted in light, cast from elsewhere. But from his eye, out his long snout, an eruption of galaxies without foreign source, born in the fish itself. An opening in the small fabric of the world, a place to fall into endlessly. He's my favorite fish, I said, still whispering. I ask everyone their favorite fishes, and I always hoped I'll say the ghost pipe fish. So there's the ghost pipe fish. <laughs> 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 okay, so I'll, I'll stop with that, I think, for the reading, but um, I would love to answer any questions. Um, I'll say anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, the obvious question that I guess is what was the genesis of this book? Mm, yeah, um, when I, um, well first I grew up in Alaska and the first king salmon I caught was taller than I was and 250 pound halibut and the fish were kind of mythic and unbelievable. So fish always seemed to me like more than fish from early on. I used to be in the back of the boat hitting with a hammer and I was kind of a complicated relationship. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I realized that's maybe not the best thing to mention on the pathway of friendship and how close I was to the fish, uh, the hammer. Uh, but um, then uh, when I was in California, junior high, I had like eight fish tanks scattered throughout the house I and mean, they're all over the place. Uh, I mean, really everywhere. And on the weekends, I was mostly cleaning the fish tanks, which may explain some early social problems. Galen <laughs> 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 really saved me in high school in 10th grade. I had such crappy friends before that. It was torture. It was awful. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I had the fish. Uh, I loved staring at them all the time. And then in 1994, which is the year that the book is set because of that visit, uh, I visited the Seattle Aquarium, and all the descriptions beside the tank were about people. And it seemed to be about my life. I was learning things about my life from the descriptions of the fish. It was really remarkable. I mean, whoever wrote those was like, you know, a thwarted poet who has to write descriptions of fish for the aquarium. I absolutely loved it. And it always stayed in my mind that it would be nice to write about fish as a, as a landscape. Uh, it's an indirect way to write about ourselves. Cause in, in my other books, the first two, Legend of Suicide and Caribou Island, which are set in Alaska, and then Dirt and Goat Mountain set in California, the center of each book is describing the place, the, the landscape, the natural landscape. And it acts like a Rorschach test, like an inkblot drawing. I, you know, we, when you look at that, you can't see it just as ink on paper. You start seeing shapes and pattern and meaning. You make it into something. And that's the same way when I try to describe the forests in Alaska or the, the hot mountain landscape in California, I end up inevitably describing the inside life of the characters and their conflicts, and there's a kind of vision of, of the world, of, of what that story is really about, who the characters are, what the story means, you know, theme. In American fiction, there's a long tradition in American fiction where a theme is, is really built through all those paragraphs of landscape description. 
and that's been going on for a long time in American writers. So that's really the, uh, I, I write with no plan or outline. I have no idea what the books will be about. And they're written just through a character with a problem and describing a place. And whenever I get stuck, I just keep describing the place. And, and what I love, the reason I write, is because those kind of unconscious transformations that happen as the, sh the place, that description, surprises me and becomes something else, um, you know, that's really the whole ball of wax for me. So to give an example, in Caribou Island, Irene is running in the forest. And it's a very troubled moment in the story. And she feels like the whole island is top heavy. The rocks and trees are too heavy on top, and the whole thing's going to turn over. And the slick underside is <laughs> exposed to the sky. And, like, those are the moments of strange transformation where the character sees the landscape, and, and it starts to reflect their psychology in some way, just to give one example. So I liked the idea of trying an urban novel, which I've never done before. But as you saw in several passages I read, it's an urban novel that's been transformed back into a natural landscape. Uh, she sees Seattle if it's, as if it's underwater. The starfish at night with the lights and the black fingers between where there's no buildings. Uh, the, the lights overhead from the plains like deep sea anglers. Uh, the, the section I just read, um, the, the different apartments like colonies, you know, polyps for a coral colony. Uh, and then the fish themselves, whenever the old man and Caitlin are talking about the fish, they're talking about themselves. It's the indirect way that we find out who they are. Uh, so that was kind of the, the inspiration for it, that I've always seen fish as being a metaphor, as indicating something about us, because they're so weird and particular in their behaviors. So for each aspect of our behavior that we can sense a little bit, some fish has made that its life. Like, that's all it is. <laughs> 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 it's really good looking for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I've been reading Caribou Island in the middle of the night when I've been wide awake. Wow. <laughs> a week or two weeks. Cool. Um, and it's been keeping me very good company. I've been enjoying it. Um, <laughs> and when you first started talking, you were talking about, um, you know, writing your family stories. And I'm, I'm curious about how you think about fiction and what fiction has to do that's different than writing our family stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've written a, uh, two memoirs that are really sailing memoirs, but have a little bit discussion about my father in them. And I wrote a nonfiction book about a school shooting in which I include my own memoir of growing up with guns and after his suicide, aiming at the neighbors with 300 Magnum and shooting out street lamps and, and um, having kind of guns instead of therapy for three years. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I told everyone who died of cancer. Galen is actually the, the first person I told the truth to. Like, he made it possible for me to tell the truth and completely turned my life around. Like, I, I was going really down with guns of therapy for three years and really separated from my friends. And with Galen, I could tell the truth, and then he brought me to a drama group where I told the truth to a group of people. And totally, like, my life became better after that. It was the arts. It was theater, which I first did, and then writing, so... Anyway, Yay. 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 Um, so that that true story I have written in some memoirs, but uh, the true story of my dad's suicide doesn't really exist. Like each one of us in the family has a different version of what happened, what it meant, uh, who he was, and I keep getting new information. I just saw my stepmother, and I just got new information that I hadn't had, and it happens constantly like that. And as you get new information, the story changes, you know, your, this meaning. And also, as I get older, as I have my own failures, which I have quite a few of now, I, I'm more <laughs> sympathetic to him. I see his story differently. So that changes the story also. Early on, it was all our kind of shame and guilt and anger really warped all the stories that we had. So uh, fiction, I think I need it for its power of transformation unconsciously. The, the transformations, I think what happens, the reason they happen is that they enable a story that otherwise couldn't be told directly, it finds some indirect way that now that material can be told. So, for instance, I could never describe what it was like first finding out my dad died or what his body would have looked like, and I never saw his body. But in Legend of a Suicide, which I thought was that there's a novella, which most of it, at the end of it, it was supposed to be my dad's suicide. I was supposed to get closer to understanding that. But halfway through, the boy kills himself which is a complete shock to me, something I didn't see coming mm -hmm. at all, whatsoever. I was halfway through the sentence before I saw that. And so the next day I went back and, and planned to cut that and change it, continue with my plan. Uh, but I reread all those pages, like 80 pages or so, and it was like reading them for the first time, like someone else had written them. 
because all this pattern was leading to that moment. So that's the first time I understood how unconscious writing is, that there's all this pattern there <coughs> that we didn't plan, and that that's actually what's exciting about writing. And once that moment happened, it unlocked all that material in that story. Now I could write about the father discovering his son, his grief on his son's suicide, and because it was indirect, now I could finally write about that grief. And he could describe the body and make it real. I could make my dad's suicide real finally, like accept it at a level that I hadn't before. You know, it wasn't to freak out any readers to describe the body. It's because I needed it to be there. And uh, I, I just think that's so beautiful, what writing does. Uh, it freaks out, has freaked out some people in my family because they're, they're kind of monstrous transformations. And they make things, in some cases, worse than what it was. But they're necessary transformations that, that enable the this, this story to unlock and, and free itself. Um, and I also, I, I think, um, I love that freedom also because of the drama group we were in. It was a great early influence because it was all improv. Nothing was staged, planned. And you weren't supposed to ever fake an emotion. If you wanted to be sad, you're supposed to make your voice like dry grass, but not pretend to be sad. You know, it's from our teacher, um, Beth Craven, from, um, had been influenced, I think, by the Polish Laboratory Theater. Is that the right name for that group? Yeah. And Galen and others actually stayed together after high school and went to, to Poland, and, and uh, uh, which sounded like it was a fantastic experience. But, but I loved that idea of, of uh, art not being faked, that it's real, that it actually does something real. We're not supposed to stage it and pretend anything, that actually we're looking to find something, you know, that there are real transformations that occur. Uh, and I can't get my nonfiction to transform in the same way, because I ha can't make up character or event. I can't have things suddenly you know, shift in some other way. There are better nonfiction writers who can. I'm not saying that nonfiction can't do it. Like Toby Wolf's memoir, This Boy's Life, is so flexible and great for representing a life. Certainly, he wasn't limited in it. Um, but for me, I, I can't really do it. Or haven't been able to so. That was kind of a long answer. <laughs> 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 I just realized that maybe it went a little long. That was a good question, I was suggesting. <laughs> Aside from all that, I spent a month in the last one, the Denali Highway. Mm -hmm. How many years were you there? I was born there in the Aleutian Islands and then lived until I was five or so in Ketchikan, something like that. How old? Did you see Grizzly? Well, how, how often do you have your mother? Field. Biographical questions. We went up when you were two until about six. Yeah. Yeah, because we started in. Um, uh, Adak, where I was born, and I guess we lived in Reading for like six months or something, mm -hmm. and then went back to Ketchikan, so about until about six, and then Northern California. Too. About Anchorage? Uh, no, but my dad was in Anchorage for a little bit, and we went through it a lot. He moved around a lot, so we spent some time in uh, Kodiak, Fairbanks, Anchorage. Saw grizzlies? Did you? Oh, yeah, everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> well, the Kenai Peninsula, yeah, and that area is a great place. Um, Did you ever get to the Arctic Circle? Yeah, yeah. Fairbanks is actually really close to it, so I learned to water ski inside the Arctic Circle. I had my dad's big loose wetsuit. It turns out it doesn't really work if they're really loose. It was cold. It was really cold. And I was learning the deep water start where you have to sit in the water and then you get yanked a little bit. You know, and then the boat comes around, you sit in the cold water, and then you get yanked a little bit. And the boat comes around, and you do that like 30 times. So, uh, yeah, I remember this particularly cold experience. And I was right next to a town which is called North Pole, where they have lots of Santa stuff and jokes. And, uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, and I've been to the Arctic in Norway also recently, this, just this fall on a festival. And it's beautiful. But it was a sunny, nice day, and I was hiking around. In October, which is a rare Yeah. Yeah, we saw all the northern lights and, and a softball game in the middle of the summer in Fairbanks, as you can see, without lights. Yeah, and actually the inspiration for Caribou Island was when I visited Alaska in January and I was walking out on that frozen lake. And uh, I, I wanted to get to the island, Super Island, where sometimes people live. Or sorry, uh, Caribou Island. Um, but I knew I'd be the first jerk to fall through the ice and die. I mean, I had so many sailing disasters. Like, I built a boat here in Napa. I, I was given Worst Boat Builder of the Year Award for the world <laughs> back in 2007. Yeah. So I knew I would, I would be the first one to fall through the ice and die on that lake. So I bent down to brush the snow off the ice to find out how thick it was, if it was safe. And I was surprised to see it was just black, and you couldn't see it, it was like two inches or 10 feet. There's no way to tell, because it's 600 feet deep, and so it makes the ice just black. 
And uh, so suddenly I could see that Irene, the main character, that uh, she would do that same thing and look into uh, 30 years of marriage, just become nothing. And uh, I could see that, suddenly I could see what the book was. And I'd been stuck before. Uh, so I scurried back and wrote that scene, which is not the beginning, it's actually page like 252 or 253 or something. But then um, wrote the book from beginning to end. And it was really good, I had that moment of inspiration because uh, I had written 50, 48 pages of that book uh, 12 years before. When Legend of a Suicide had only three reviews, but one of them was full page New York Times and my career kind of took off in fiction, my agents called me on Sunday and they're like, we need a novel by tomorrow. Yeah. I was like, okay. So I went to the office, I looked through all my stuff. I uh, looked again like all the way to the very bottom and found these 48 pages that I'd kind of forgotten about from so many years before. But I totally lied. When I was on the phone with the editors, I said, yeah, the momentum is just tremendous. It's crazy. I've written these 48 pages in the last six weeks, and the novels just seem to be writing itself. So I was so happy to have the moment of inspiration, because otherwise I was in deep doo-doo. I mean, I had no idea how to write a novel. I'd never done it. Can you talk more about the relationship Caitlin had with her mother and how that affected the daughter? And I mean... I'm a mom now, you know, I have twins, they're almost three, and so the way you captured the stress a mother feels, you know, she has to work, she has to support her daughter, but then she feels like her childhood was kind of ripped from her in her teenage years, and she had to support her sick mother, and so how did you, I don't know, how did you figure out how to write about also a woman's world and, and all those relationships and... In a yeah, I don't know. I hope it seemed convincing. It was. <laughs> yeah, what was strange was writing about her relationship with Shawling also, like a, you know, a, a gay relationship at 12 years old and the you know beginning of a romance. And it's not something I would have planned ahead of time. Like, hey, I should set out to try to do that. That would work really well. And, but it's just what happened uh, with the characters. And and Shawling was based on um, uh, one of my best friends. He's actually like that in her character and everything. And so I was just kind of writing her, like describing her. Uh, but, but really, I think writing um, women characters, I've realized I've now written seven books of fiction. Uh, only, was it four or five of them are published now? Uh, this is the fifth one. Uh, but there's seven novels. Uh, well, Legend of Suicide and six novels. So there's two more. And altogether, four of them are from women's points of view and just three from men's points of view. Uh, so it's actually the majority. Like the next two, there's... There's one about um, Medea set 3,000 years ago, very sympathetic from her point of view, as a destroyer of kings who wants a world not ruled by men. And then uh, one with a woman who's 47, a professor uh, who's an artist who does aluminum sculpture in um, um, uh, Florida. But uh, I grew up, as you know, almost all with women. I mean, after dad died and the grandfathers were gone, I, I think I counted at one point, I think there were 11 women in our family all single of different generations, and only one man, Uncle Doug, related by blood, and then my cousin Richard, and maybe there's some others that are related by marriage. Um, and so that all actually seemed kind of natural. And the way I write women characters is to uh, just write them as me, like there's no changes or adjustment, because I don't think in fundamental ways, like we have so many differences on the surface, and, and uh, socially, you know, and how our lives are constructed in many ways. But in terms of how we experience the big things, like grief, for instance, I, I haven't ever seen a difference, you know, on the, on the major things. And so, kind of for the core of what it means to be lonely, or what it means to feel angry, or to have something taken away, or, you know, to want something like it, those all seem the, the same, like the deepest character motivation. So, so I've never made any difference for male and female characters. And in terms of the, Relationship, I, I really am a neoclassical writer writing Greek tragedy, the same as we've been doing for 2,500 years. And it's just putting the characters into a pressure, pressure cooker, you know, in a, a short period of time, in a small amount of location, small space, where there's not a lot of distraction or outside characters. And uh, they're put under pressure until they're breaking in various ways. You know, the, the old man comes in and, and puts a lot of pressure on Caitlin's mother. and uh, and. Caitlin's mother's already under pressure from working class job and not enough hours and not able to get ahead and trying to be good to Caitlin in all ways, but uh, you know can't help but start to fail 
uh, and get really angry as she's put under pressure because there's no extra room, you know, she has no reserves. Uh, so it all just kind of uh, made sense. I mean, most of my adult life has been below the poverty line, and I felt really like, you know, like without safety net and, and under pressure, and I failed so much in my boat business. I was always under time pressures and didn't have enough money. Uh, so I knew I knew what that feels like for sure. Um, so I haven't had a kid, and I wonder like, is the relationship believable between the mother and daughter? I mean, I don't know. Um, but I, I tried. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like I tried to not make it work. <laughs> Writing fiction is really fun because you go different places and different relationships. Like this one, the two two minor characters, Steve and Shalini, are based on my good friends, and I really just like them. Uh, but the other characters are all made up. They're not anyone from my family. They're not exactly me or anyone I know. And it was it was cool to just, you know, have that that wonderful freedom to try to invent living, breathing people who feel like they have weight on the page. That's what I was afraid of in moving from family material to not writing about my family, is that they they wouldn't have any weight, you know, any gravity to them. You wouldn't believe in uh, who they were and, and their problems and such. I think that's the challenge. I think that's why it's good to start with a few books of working from family because, you know, you, there's some weight to everybody. I have a lot of students in England who won't write about their families because they're so polite. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes the stories just don't pass the so what test. You know, like, oh, but so what? <laughs> but they are polite. It's nice. So it's so funny. They get conflicting advice. Um, you know, I'm always like, well, you just have to write about your family. You have to be free to write about whatever. And, and, uh, and I've really taken that kind of extreme. My family's been very generous uh, <laughs> uh, in response to that and still read my books and loved me and supported me. And I've been very lucky in that way. Um, but the other teacher there tells them, you have to be very careful. I, I change my nonfiction and everything to make sure I don't hurt my family. So they go from one class to another. And I'm like, <laughs> so, yeah. So were you tempted, like in the scene where there's the they they go out to get the Christmas tree and they're in the snow and the girls get lost? Were you tempted to kill off the characters? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's so mean. Oh my God. I'm my sister. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna die here. And thankfully they didn't. But <laughs> yeah, it got a little touch and go for a minute there. Um, yeah, I didn't. I don't want to kill off any of my characters. I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I want everything to work out for her, buddy. The rescue was kind of last minute. I was sweating it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. They won. Losing <laughs> feeling in their body. Yeah, yeah. It was wild writing about Medea, because that, I knew what the events have to be, because I'm following a, a story. And it's so brutal. It starts with the opening scene, she's on the back of the Argo with the Argonauts, and she's cut her brother into pieces, oh. and she's throwing a piece into the water to slow down her father's boat. Happy woman. And then later, she uh, cuts a ram into a stew as a rehearsal for cutting up a king into a stew. And then after that, she uh, finishes off the next king and his daughter, who's going to be Jason's next wife. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the Greeks, man. That's Sometimes I'll call it dark or whatever in the fiction, but compared to the Greeks, I mean, it's nothing. <laughs> yeah. um, other questions? What spurred you to start writing in the first place since you had started with drama? Uh, well, I had been writing when I was a kid. Uh, my mom really encouraged me to write, and she actually had me tell stories about squirrels when we were in Lakeport after we first moved from Alaska. I was about six years old, and she would write down the squirrel stories. So, I mean, uh, we have other like super moms in the audience, like Gina DeLuca, whose children are doing amazing things. <laughs> I mean, really, if your mother like really, uh, you know, is there as a as a partner in your education, like really kind of encouraging all the way along and making it happen. Like my mom always had me revise my essays and stories and stuff, like like and, and think about what I was doing and made the education meaningful. It was never like, just do it because you have to do it. You know, it was, it was really like, you know, here's what's beautiful and great about this, and you have to do this. And, and um, that, so I loved it, you know, it was fun. And I also came from this family that was a, you know, a, a pack of total liars, especially the men. Like when we were fishing, you know, there's all the lies about fish, but then there were bigger lies. Like 
who's responsible for whose divorce or whose suicide. I mean, you know, big lies. So I, I came from this hunting and fishing background that's naturally storytelling. Uh, a family that had some tragedies that you know we didn't, couldn't find the truth about. And then I was really encouraged to write in my education and stuff. And that combination meant that I always wanted to write. And I always loved it. And I wrote stories when I was a kid with little collections of our hunting and fishing stories. And they had titles like North to Alaska. <laughs> and little drawings, and we laminated the pages, and it was another project. Well, was kind of yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I always wanted to do that. In high school, I wrote really bad New Age poetry, you know, which <laughs> was really earnest, <laughs> and featured like forest creatures who might be bodhisattvas. <laughs> 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 and it always seemed to feature my great love for some woman I would meet and how you know, we would form some glowing ball in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're very romantic. Nice. Um, so anyway, and then uh, I went to college. And uh, my first um, year of college, I was at Williams, and you couldn't get into like your third year. I couldn't take creative writing. I was very disappointed. So I switched to Stanford, which has a wonderful creative writing program. Fantastic. John Lohr was my mentor for a long time, was so generous and really changed my life a lot. And I also got to study with Grace Paley, who was visiting there, and Audrey and Rich. I mean, incredible, like, really amazing. So, yeah, that's always all that I wanted to do, really. I just couldn't get published or make any money. So, I had eight years as a captain of lots of disasters at sea, and, you know, boat builder. And before that, I made sandwiches, and I carried aluminum paint onto roofs, and <laughs> sprayed poison under houses, and, you know, all kinds of crappy jobs. And, and then teaching, which I like. I also like to teach. And I know from the emailing we did over a few years, you've been, you've traveled all over. You were teaching in lots of interesting places, like Istanbul. Yeah, I wasn't actually teaching there, but I, I taught in New Zealand, and I teach in England now, and I've had book tours in 30 countries and visited other ones. I've been traveling a lot for about yeah. five or six years, something like that. Yeah, but you've been in some great places, too, mm. like the Grove Mercado. Yeah. Actually know anybody else who's been there. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in Turkey, sailing on the coast, and I used to run charters there. So, Mike, you said mm. a book... Um, in the foreign well, the Medea book is the Black Sea and uh, the Aegean right. and Greece, uh, but it, you know, a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> I'll take a lot really long time ago. Like, <laughs> 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 we didn't know much culture in literature, so yeah, it's a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I love Medea because she's, um, the Greeks imagined that time period, 3,250 years ago, as the beginning of Western culture and literature. So all the characters from that time period are demigods, like her grandfather's the sun. Um, but it's really the end of this older world. It's the fall of the Bronze Age, the fall of the Hittite Empire, the Egyptians in decline. And Medea is this threat that comes from the older world. You know, the threat is the idea of Western culture and literature and, and, and what they are and, and what they can do. Uh, so in addition to being a destroyer of kings, she's also said to me, in the most interesting time period that there's been. So, I like the archaeology from that time period. And my book's actually set in the archaeology of that time, not like Euripides' play where it's set in his time. Much later. Can't have lemons or silk. <laughs> 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 well, I'm not going to read it if there's no lemons. Yeah. <laughs> Standards, you know, you have to decide what am I going to read and what not. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. 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 Well, okay. Yeah. Well, I recommend some, recommend some of my friends at least. <laughs> so I think um, we're, is it about at the hour time? We started about seven. You better do one I more can question. Do a last and then question. We'll, we'll change. Last we'll question. have. And then, of course, I'm happy to sign time. or Great. chat afterwards, whatever. <laughs> the last question. The zinger. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much pressure. It is. It's a lot of pressure. It's right. Why is it you can't do X? <laughs> well, ask yourself a question. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, what, what should somebody have asked you? Or what's the question nobody ever asked you? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Is your writing ever going to get better? <laughs> That's what I wonder. That's the question I have. Like, I'm actually uh, I'm finishing my translation of Old English uh, from Beowulf from Old English, and uh, which I've been working on for like three years. And I've studied Latin every day for the last year, and I'm translating from Latin because I'm desperate to try to improve my writing. 
and that's how I think I can get there. Uh, so it's an open question to me. I don't know how how I how it is you improve. You know, when you have your first creative writing class, it's so exciting because you learn a lot. And I remember asking my teacher for my second class. I was like, so. Uh, what do we learn this next time? <laughs> like, what do we get? And they're like, well, after the beginning class, you kind of learned everything we have to teach. You just kind of have to do it after that. <laughs> Maybe it works. <laughs> 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 really? What English author do you really love reading when, maybe when you were younger? What, which one do you really like? Well, at first it was Curious George. <laughs> uh, I liked those books. Those were cool. Then it was uh, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. Uh, later in puberty, it was embarrassing the, the array of books I was reading. It was uh, these series that would be adventure but have some sex. Uh, I had westerns. They have like sex westerns out there. I don't know if you know about that genre. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them was uh, by the author Jake Slocum. Slocum. <laughs> the, the, the covers are so embarrassing. I would sometimes rip the cover off of their book. My mom would be like, "What happened to your book?" I'm like, "I don't know." <laughs> so it's, the, it's not just the the um, stranger comes to town and beats the bad guys. He sleeps with several women in the town. There's a little, you know, it's a delay before having the showdown with the bad guys. <laughs> Uh, T.H. Lawrence was considerably later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did. I, I read, you know, all kinds of the, the classics. I, I was an English major and then in grad school also. And, um, uh, so, yeah. Um, short stories is what I was studying. So D.H. Lawrence is big for short stories. And, and, and I mean, all the Flannery O'Connor was the biggest influence for me. And, uh, I mean, there's like a hundred short story writers are big influences by like Grace Bailey who I studied with and um, uh, I mean big ones like uh, Carver and uh, Faulkner and Hemingway and all those but I really liked um, Catherine Ann Porter I loved New Wine I, I love novellas and I ended up reading a lot of novellas uh, the book that I've read most is Blood Meridian. I've read six times by Cormac McCarthy. Mm -hmm. um, but other than him, he's my favorite. But then the next like six or something are women writers, actually. And I had mostly, most of my teachers were women. And the teacher who influenced me the most, who got me to read all my interests now, came from this one woman, Leslie Cahoon, who was just a lecturer at Stanford, but really brilliant. And she's the one who got me interested in Medea, which has now become a novel. Uh, got me interested in Middle English and Chaucer, uh, which was where the title Legend of Suicide came from, from the tradition of writing about saints' lives. The legend really means a series of portraits. Uh, getting me interested in taking Latin, and uh, which really improved my writing a lot at the time. Uh, and uh, Beowulf, I mean, everything. It was a Western, like, great works, Western culture great works course, right before that was no longer possible, and all those courses got cut. And I'm so happy I got to have it right at the end because uh, it was incredible. It informed all my interests for the rest of my life. It came from that one year long course. Did you finish Finnegan's Wake? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't finish Infinite Jest either. Oh, no, me neither. Um, I, I loved, um, I loved uh, uh, Joyce's other work, like Dubliners and uh, Support of the Artist. Uh, and I actually teach experimental writing, uh, like generative devices and stuff. And I had a class with Gail Sorrentino, I thought it was really interesting at Stanford. Um, but, but the long, it, what, what, the reason why I can't finish like Infinite Jest, say, something actually easier than, a lot easier than Finnegan's Wake, but still kind of maddening, is that when I get 60 pages in, he gives me thousands of details that don't matter. Like the whole layout of the campus and the buildings. So he's completely refused the same, what I think is one of the two central ideas of literature, which is that it's selection and emphasis. And, and the, the writer that everyone seems to really love now, Knauskar, apparently from what I've heard, he ignores that principle also. And we'll give you 30 pages of shade here. So, but for 2,500 years, we've left most of the story out. You know, we haven't given details that don't matter. Uh, we, if, if something isn't cohesive, it doesn't fit in the text more, we, we, we eliminate it. 
And I just, I have a hard time giving up that idea. The other principle, I think, is that there has to be subtext. That whenever you're writing about something, that any st good story is about something else. It's about one thing, but it's also about something else. And that's why blogs and stuff suck so much, because they're actually just about one thing. <laughs> like the whole generation of people is growing up thinking that that's interesting to read. I mean, that, that to me is the biggest threat to literature, not ebooks. But if a whole bunch of people start to think that when you read one thing and that's enough, just an account, but it's not actually about anything, that that's reading, that is kind of the death of literature, because literature survives on that principle. Uh, but anyway, I just think it's indulgent. I think it's only men who do these long, indulgent, big books with thousands of details that don't matter and expect us to wade through that crap. Like, I, I just am not willing to do it. And I understand that Pinnacan's Wake is something different, where it's played with language and it's brilliant linguistically. I'm just not smart enough to, you know, be able to really, like, get it. I, I find it frustrating, and after a while I give up. Hmm. I'm so small when I fit. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible to have to admit on stage things that you haven't read. Haven't read it happened last night in San Francisco. Like Patrick Modiano, people are like, so what do you think of him? Because we were talking about France. You know, my friend Tom Barbash. I was like, <laughs> the terrible moment. <laughs> <Red. laughs> no, there's no way out. You know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> but why did I admit it again tonight? <laughs> that's, that's it balances you out. You've been sounding brilliant all night. So like, oh, oh, thank you, my sister. <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you again to Book Passage.